Hi there, everyone. I was fortunate enough to be able to sit down with Alessandro, the founder of the Express LRS project, and get his perspective on the history of the system, how it started and how it got to where it is today, the technological differences between Express LRS and Crossfire, Tracer and Ghost, and the future of Express LRS and some of the features they've got planned, the like of which we have never seen before in FPV. It was a really exciting conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe button and let's not waste any more time. Let's dive straight into the interview. I guess, yeah, we'll, we'll just jump straight into it. Um, thank you, Alessandro, so much for having this call with me. I'm really excited to chat with you all about ELRS and what you've been doing. Um, and I'm sure everyone who's going to be watching this, this interview later is also going to really appreciate some more information about the system um, and your insights on you know, where it's come from, uh, how it compares now to the other systems that are available out there in the market and like where it's going in the future. So uh, I really appreciate that. I wonder if um, for people who maybe don't know you personally, if you could give me just a quick introduction to, to you and yourself, where you're coming from. Yeah, sure. So hi, everyone. I'm Alessandro. So I am, I guess you could say, the founder of the Express LRS project. I'm actually not a software engineer, funnily enough. Uh, my background is materials engineering. So probably it's quite similar to you, Chris. Um, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an academic, so I have I have a PhD in yeah, materials engineering, but it wasn't really materials engineering. Ended up more being signal processing, um, and so that's how I kind of getting into the electronic side of things. And yeah, so electronics is a very uh, is a very important hobby to me. So I've been mucking around with circuits and PCBs since I was a teenager, um, and so that's that's I guess yeah where the love of quads comes in. I'm sure lots of people can relate. Um, and then once you know, once you fly quads, you want to build them. And then once you're kind of yeah. bored of building one or two variations, you want to do something more profound. And so, I guess that's yeah, that's where Express LRS came from. All right. So, do you want to talk us through the history of the system, like where it came from, when you started working on it, and how it's kind of developed over time? Yeah, sure. So, um, it's older than most people think. Um, I actually started the project in 2018, end of 2018, I think. Um, and that's the same year I started flying quads. So as most people, I was flying FR Sky, um, quickly realized its limitations when you fail safe going around the park, <laughs> go behind yeah. any trees and you just yeah, eat the dirt and you get very upset because your quad's broken. Um, and so at the time, of course, there was only one reasonable option. It was TBS Crossfire. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a lot of digging, a lot of research. And I actually remember when I decided to do my own thing, um, I looked up the FCC docs for the TBS because they always have some PCB pictures and I saw the inside of the TBS module and I was like, oh, you know, that looks pretty simple. I could do that. <laughs> so yeah. um, a bit a bit naive in retrospect to think that, but a lot of good projects, I think, start with a bit of optimism and a bit of uh, naivety. So yeah, that, that's kind of where it started. And I would just work on it off and off uh, during my own time. Uh, it actually started off, uh, funnily enough, started off on 433 megahertz. So the first the first time I flew the system was actually on 433 because, right. oh, I don't know, I, I, I don't quite remember why I decided on 433. Um, I wanted even more range. I guess yeah, just massive start. range, right? <laughs> yeah, just, just max up the range. Um, obviously, the antennas were a huge problem. So you can't fit mm. a 433 antenna on a, on a five inch race quad. Um, and so, yeah, so look, I, I worked on it. I can't really remember when I had the first flight. Actually, I think I've got a video on my YouTube. I can look that up. Um, I think it was probably around mid 2019. I think I had had my first flight, like first successful flight, no software bugs, no falling out of the sky. <laughs> um, and so look, as I said, I'm not a software engineer. So it was it was actually the second kind of software project I'd, I'd ever attempted. Um, so the first one was, I'm not sure, maybe, maybe some people know, but Chorus 32, if anyone knows about Chorus 32, it's a lap timer project that I, um, Oh, I'm not really working on it anymore, but that was kind of my first FPV project, related project. Um, and then I kind of not got bored of that, but, you know, I got into control links um, after that. Anyway, sorry, um, back on track. So I think it was in maybe mid-2019, I had my first flight. Um, I went to the park with my couple of local friends. Um, so Jai and Wes, who are also um, developers and contributors of the project, they're local to me. Um, in Australia, local meaning within two hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, it's a big place. Yeah. It's a big place. Um, and yeah, I remember distinctly, uh, you know, flying it out to a few hundred meters and then crashing it into the dirt, into a wet dirt puddle actually, and then still having perfect si signal. And at that point I was like, oh, I'm onto something. Like, this, this can be something something good. 
Um, and yeah, so that that was nine. That was the uh, 900 megahertz days. Um, and so shortly thereafter, Jai, my friend, uh, who also works on, you know, he's got a bunch of other projects. He's got Open DTX. He's got he's designed flight controllers. You know, he's very similar to me. Um, he jumped on, so he started contributing code. And he's also not a software developer <laughs> either. So we had two non-software developers working on the project, just throwing stuff at the wall, seeing what stuck. Yeah. Um, and that, that was pretty fun. That was kind of the fast and loose days when I would just, you know, work on some code, some messy code, contribute it, go fly it the next day, crash it, have fun. Um, yeah, good old days. Uh, and then probably about six months after that, I want to say. So let's say going towards the end of 2019. Um, that's when Wes, Wes Vardy, I'm sure everyone knows Wes Vardy. That's yeah. when uh, he joined. And uh, his contribution was more or less having no fear. <laughs> so we, we would, uh, you know, we'd, we'd like, hey, Wes, we have some new code to try. And he'd go out, chuck it on his five inch cord, no GPS, no, you know, no kind of recourse and go fly it out. Yeah, fly blocks. it miles. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, Wes, that was, you know, we didn't, we, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> it could have it could have crashed uh, <laughs> so yeah that and that was a lot of fun um and so back then that was still when we were using diy hardware um yeah so every, yeah. everything was custom made um you know we designed i designed a few reference pcbs drives design drive designed some we got jlc pcb to make them we built them honestly the build was pretty you know if you can wire up a flight control you can build one of these the only issue yeah, is yeah. that they're a bit chunky you know they're um Maybe not anyway. So they're, they're probably like five millimeter stick. You know, they, they're two two boards and a PCB sandwich together. So they weren't exactly the ten by ten millimeter EP two that we have now. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so, so that was end of twenty nineteen, I think. Um, and then Christmas of twenty twenty, uh, we decided to port everything to FR Sky R nine um, because that was kind of we realized that was a bit of kit that everyone had. You know, everyone everyone bought one when it was cheap and just yeah. kind of trucked in the draw so um i knew that this would be an excellent way to kind of you know kickstart the popularity by trying to you know, if, if you could run it on some commodity hardware everyone's got um that would be a really good idea because obviously no one's gonna it's not gonna be successful if you have to build your own hardware you know, the whole time. yeah yeah and that fr sky r9 system wasn't really like living up to its potential either was it so yeah there was yeah. a lot of, yeah. lot of opportunity yeah. there yeah, we, we can talk about what what they do wrong if you want, because they did a lot of things wrong. But maybe I'll just yeah, I'll keep going about about the history for a bit longer. Yeah. Um, and so I remember distinctly it was Christmas 2020. Um, Jai and I were with our families, but talking every day, you know, getting code running. I, re I remember the first time we got the uh, R9M to blink its LED. We were like, yes, that was a, a big a big celebration. Um, of course, we we figured out its pinout. Um, and there was someone very important. I think his name was Jacob Jacob Wesler, Jacob Weisler. I, I forget actually. Um, but he had actually done something very similar to us. So he, he'd gotten his own RC link up and running on um, R9 hardware. And so he didn't okay. really go any further with it. But um, I remember in the in the, in the the dev chat, um, in, the, in the Better Fight Slack, he'd posted some videos of it. And so we talked to him and he, he helped he helped with the pin out and all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And so yeah, early, early 2020s, we got R9 up and running. Um, and that was probably when we were starting to do some proper releases, trying to do some versioning trying to deliver something that's not so bleeding edge. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, and then 20, 2021, I guess, is when it really started taking off. Um, we released, I, I forget the timeline, but I think it was probably mid-2021 when we then um, added 2.4 gigahertz support Yeah. Um, with the SX1280 chip. And we actually beat, like, we actually had 2.4 out running. You could run it before Ghost and Trace had released their systems as well. But we weren't really that big, so no one really remembers that. But I'm, uh, <laughs> we were yeah, first. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, and, and from then on, and from then we, we got some new members and some new developers on, on um, very, which was very pivotal to improving the, you know, to making this a real self sustaining functional project. Um, mm -hmm. Capri, PK, um, Zerg from the um, the configurator guys, like they were really instrumental, um, and so sure. we have we probably have had about we probably peaked a little bit in development. So now we're kind of you know not developing quite as quickly as we were, um, but still still really obviously 3.0 was a huge push, um, and yeah, so we're lucky to have you know on the order of 10 or 10 to 15 you know skilled developers contributing their time, like a very valuable time to this project and making it great, um, because otherwise it would just not be not be possible. 
All right. Yeah, well, I think that gives a really great summary of the history. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about the, the kind of the hardware architecture of modern links, um, the chipsets that are used in uh, the TX and the RX for the systems like Crossfire, Tracer, Ghost, and ELRS, of course, and yep. how those how those kind of compare and what you can tell us about that. Yeah. So yeah, look, it's it's I can tell you I'll tell you what what each, each respective system uses. Sure. So um so Ghost, Tracer, and ELRS uses the Semtec SX1280 chipset. So that's mm -hmm. a 2.4 gigahertz um, LoRa chipset. It also obviously does FLRC and it does um, GS, uh, GSK. Um, so it's just it's a modern RF chipset. Um, and so, yeah, the, the magic is is this LoRa technology, um, which is uh, it's CSS chirp spread spectrum. Um, right. It's a very yeah, it's it's a very first of all, it's patented by Semtech, so no one else can make these chips, okay. which is a little, a little bit a little bit annoying. But in time, that'll expire. But for the moment, they have the the market of it, and I don't see any other technology, uh, yeah, replacing it. And so it's mm. it's a way of doing modulation that allows you to um, receive signals below the noise floor, um, which sounds a right. little bit uh, uh, woo woo, a bit magical. Sort but of it sounds does impossible, right? That the, the yeah, point yeah. of the noise floor is it's the yeah. level below which you can't detect things. <laughs> yeah, but the the magic comes from the fact that when you have um, correlated correlated signals with uncorrelated noise, you can extract the correlated signals without uh, basically the, the, the noise can the the signals come out quicker than the noise does. Um, so you can effectively extract signals below the noise floor. And so GPS uses this um, this techno this the same. It's not it's not LoRa, but GPS uses the same. Uh, it's a coded message with a convolutional step using. I'm not exactly sure of, of the uh, technology behind it, but I know GPS also extracts signals below the noise floor. Which is why it takes so long to lock, actually, because it needs to take some guesses at what it should be doing before it actually, uh, yeah, hits a signal. So, right. yeah, so LoRa is the the main technology behind all modern RC links. Um, I mean, I guess if you ask TBS, they'd say FLRC is, and I think FLRC will have its place. Um, and I think, mm. especially for racing, I have the feeling that, yeah, I mean, I remember Trappy saying that FLRC would probably be the best choice for racing. And maybe a year ago, I didn't agree, but uh, we've do, we've been doing some tests with FLRC, and with the right modulation parameters, it does exceptionally well. Um, so, so what's the so difference that, between LoRa is this chirp spread spectrum technology, um, which is you know very long range, but presumably FLRC has um, other benefits. Yeah, so it's it's a similar thing where you have uh, the the receipt with, with FLRC. The receiver does a similar thing to LoRa, where it, it locks onto the. It, I'm, I'm sorry, I actually looked up the technical explanation beforehand, so I just know a, a rough off the top of my head. But it has a, it's a similar thing to LoRa, except LoRa uses a distinct modulation method where it, it has this, these chirps. Um, yeah. So FLRC is is FSK, it's frequency shift keying, but then it's mm. got the LoRa magic, the thing the thing that makes LoRa magical added on top, and so they call it um, FLRC. Uh, I think that's right. <laughs> Maybe, right. yeah. So, so you can't extract signals necessarily below the noise floor because you've not you're not doing the the chirping aspect of it. Yes, yeah, so I'm, you... I'm not. I'm not exactly sure if you can, or, uh, but I do know that you do not get an S. You never get a negative. Actually, you don't get any SNR reported from the chipset with um, with FLRC. Um, so I have a feeling it it doesn't. Um, and yeah. the interesting thing is that when you when you work on this project or this kind of project long enough and you try all you try all the different you know try you try all the modulation parameters you you do experiments see what work be, what works best you always end up finding like weird things about the chipsets that just don't make sense so that, are, that are not documented and that you yes. kind of scratch your head you're like oh that should work but it doesn't <laughs> and so i don't think any of this is black and white and i think only the gray beards at semtech could answer <laughs> these kind of questions um with with, with authority to be honest. Yeah, um, I mean, um, I mean, I work in the in the semiconductor field, so I sort of have a little experience of this. Of quite often, you will have extra features mm. in in the code or in the chipset that you maybe were intending to release, or you you are going to release to certain customers, but that you haven't kind of done enough testing or validation of to kind of release to everyone and to document properly. And so, yeah, you tend to find these little Easter eggs where there are modes that are undocumented that you can activate 
that achieve certain certain performance um and yeah you just don't know you don't know exactly what these modes were developed for maybe they're developed for a specific application or specific customer um or they were just a great idea but because of like time or budget constraints they weren't able to be validated to the level that they could be put in the data sheet but they're still in there so yeah it's yeah. it's pretty common actually we have yeah. we, we actually use, use one products. of those undocumented features uh in the 900 megahertz chipset there is uh in the, in the data sheet it says it doesn't work but if you try it it works uh it's a way to set the um the interrupt request on a pin to both to interrupt both on a, a receive um completion and a transmit done completion um and so it's a technically an undocumented feature but we tested it and it works and it saves us one SPI call in the in the yeah. you know in, in the part of the code where it transfers the the um you know it does all the bits to talk to the chip so yeah um i, I also found another in, uh, annoying uh bug where um so this is for 900 megahertz we were using a combination of like the this was back in 1.0 days so the packet structure has changed now but we, we had a header that contains some packet type it contained an address and it contained a, a bit of other information um and what our i was concerned that our address space was too small um that we have the the, the there was you could make an argument that enough people fly together you could have an address collision so i thought okay let's also utilize what's called the, the, the there's a there's a header in the laura packet that you can set um it's called the, it's called the sync word and so i was like let's also set the sync word um based on the uid and let's randomize that and give us some extra bits um to, to work yeah. with an address base and on the bench it worked we tested it worked then we released it and we got a bunch of reports that this the link was uh not working as expected and it turns out that certain values of that Laura sync word were, for whatever reason, at the at the spreading factor we were using, which was the fastest one, the the receiver just wasn't um, demodulating them properly. It wasn't, yeah, right. It just wasn't working. And it was not documented. No one, no one knew. I um, Jai made an account on the Semtech forum and made a post about it. I actually don't remember how what ended up with what ended up happening if they put an official errata or whatever. But yeah, we discovered that. This chip doesn't work under these conditions, uh, and that's happened more than once. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's it's been interesting. Absolutely. Um, um, so all the all the chips that you're using for the 900 megahertz and 2.4 gig are all from Semtech. Yes, they're all from Semtech. Yeah. So we covered a bit of 2.4. Let's talk about the 900. So 900 mm. um, is going out of favor a little bit. I have to say, everyone seems to be jumping onto 2.4, and I think that's fair enough. I think for 90% of 99% of people 2.4 is mm -hmm. what they should choose um but i do yeah i do admit that 900 megahertz still has some um yeah has some applications for example just the other day i was um, browsing rc groups and someone was using uh 900 megahertz elrs on a sub like underwater sub and they were oh, wow. they were claiming they were getting you know they could dive the sub to one and a half meters and walk away 70 70 meters and still have telemetry and controlling um which you wouldn't usually expect that you'd expect the attenuation to be enough yeah. to not link but i guess yeah i guess so look it has applications and so on the 900 side of things there's actually a few more um chips you can use so there's there's a, a broader selection um mm. so the r9 hardware which is i guess what we use um and, and on the diy designs it's the sx1276 mm -hmm. uh, then there's also the sx1262 which is a, like a kind of modernized version of that and then Crossfire, because Crossfire was developed, you know, eight years ago, or however long it was sure. developed. They use a slightly older chipset, which functionally is the same for what we care about. Um, it's the SX1272, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and so they are actually almost all intercompatible, except for the SX1262, right. which, funnily enough, it's actually really annoying. I, I wish they hadn't done this, <laughs> but it works uh, at the fastest rate. So at the 200 megahertz spreading factor that we use, it doesn't mm -hmm. communicate with the other two chips at all so right if, if because it, they don't support the fastest factor or they do but it's just different they they changed how the header uh, how the header works on on that chip uh, on, on the highest spreading rates i'm not sure if maybe they fixed some maybe they fixed the problem i talked about earlier i'm not sure i haven't investigated it but they changed yeah. it sufficiently enough that they can't talk to each other um but also they added an even faster modulation rate spreading factor five i think they added um that would in theory allow would, would have allowed us to do 300 hertz update rate on 900 megahertz um, wow 
but yeah, we yeah. decided not to attempt to build that hardware because it would just be a it'd just be a nightmare with compatibility etc and there was already enough you know cheap secondhand r9 gear in the market and yeah, 200 hertz was yeah, this was back when crossfire was doing you know crossfire was maxing out at 150 mm -hmm. um, ghost on the table yet no no one else had yet yeah, we, we were the fastest and I, I was happy with that so there was no reason to try to go faster yeah cool yeah it makes sense i mean also if you if you need the really really fast rates then 2.4 gig gives you much much more bandwidth so it's sort yeah. of and at 900 megahertz i mean a lot of people are, are concerned about range and so they may not want to be running the fastest rate i guess we'll come on and talk about the trade-offs with like packet rate and range and things a little bit later yeah sure. um so i think yeah we've covered the the hardware architecture really nicely so let's talk a little bit about software now and how how you think the the software for for elrs kind of compares to the other systems that you've talked about um fr sky crossfire tracer those those systems yeah yeah well obviously like those are closed source systems so the this, this is all going to be highly speculative uh so hopefully yeah. no one can send me the authority on on how they work or anything like that um just done that so i guess look let, let, let's start with with how i architected the software system and maybe we can talk about some of the things that i think are, are interesting or, or special um mm -hmm. so for, from day one i kind of decided i wanted to have performance as the number one feature so i wanted to have yeah. everything happens as quickly uh, uh, the whole so everything st when, when a packet comes in everything stops and all of everything is dedicated to getting that packet out the serial bus and then going yeah. back and listening for another packet and so i spent a lot of time figuring out um for instance you know you, you have to configure a bunch of registers when you change modes when you change between frequencies when you do all these things and so I, I spent a lot of time looking at the registers and figuring out what things you can afford not to change right because that makes the turnaround quicker mm. so express LRS is kind of a little bit different and maybe the, some people consider this a criticism which is actually addressed in 3.0 now and we can talk about that later but uh we have a very very high duty cycle so we spend a lot of time transmitting um and so that mm. is one of the things that gives you more range because you have the longer you spend transmitting the slower you can transmit so mm. the more favorable the modulation um, parameters are for for long range mm. now you know you could also make the argument yes but then you have interference issues and i do agree um the forward error correction does help a little bit with that but yeah it is having a higher duty cycle does mean that you might be more susceptible to causing and receiving interference um anyway so the and the reason it the reason i guess we have high duty cycles is because i just assumed well, when i first started working on it i just assumed that's what everyone did because i thought that was you know that made sense to me um i thought let's yeah. just ma maximize the time you transmit you can transmit more power you can transmit further you know all, all the beneficial things um, and so we really, really, really squeezed every last microsecond um, out, out of it. So um, there is there is kind of like a few critical time windows. Um, so I think if you go look at like the Express on on I get if you go if you go look I think it's common dot h. Um, you go look at the, the there's a there's a table with like uh, OTA time like the time that it takes to transmit a packet. Um, and they're all right up against the packet interval. Like there's only like two, 200 to 500 microseconds spare time in between right. each packet to do everything you need to do. So that includes changing modes, that includes frequency hopping, that includes calculating the next packet to send. So everything's really, really squeezed together. Sure. Um, and so I kind of architected everything to just run on interrupts. So everything is just like this huge stack of interrupts. Whenever a packet comes in, it just goes and then spits yep. out another packet. And then it just goes back to kind of not doing very much um and that also was a bit of a headache uh, because you can have race conditions you can have problems like yeah that, that kind of stuff do take a while to sort to sort out and, and mm -hmm. get reliable um and also because the project's built upon other projects so it's, it's built upon like the arduino framework which isn't always optimized for speed um, yeah. for, optimized for uh just being easy and obviously that, that was because i wasn't that good of a programmer back then so <laughs> that's yeah but you know it we, we're at the stage now where it's fast it's reliable and i'm really happy with it um i want to talk about actually one one thing that i know that well i suspect that we do differently we do, at least we do differently from fr sky and crossfire and probably ghost i think um so one of the core technical challenges in a control link is the frequency hopping 
So sure. you have to you have to frequency hop uh, almost at the same time. Well, yeah, effectively at the same time because you have yeah. this random sequence of frequencies that you, you go through, and the receiver and transmitter have to be on the right frequency at the right time to receive the, to receive anything. Yeah, and so communicating that and having that uh, synchronicity um, established at range through a lossy signal uh, through a lossy you know, through a lossy link. Is, yeah. Is, is a big challenge um if you look up the two generals problem like it's it's not it's not a solvable problem like it's it just yeah yeah it's, it's it's really hard um and one of the core kind of uh things that express LRS has or one of the core things that i worked on early on was this this way to do that um and so we have essentially i haven't done like a formal analysis of it I, it, it could be probably be improved actually i've been thinking about looking at analyzing it formally but what we have is essentially a um, software, I think I think it classifies as a second order software PLL. Um, so we, we have this phase lock loop that runs in software uh, that locks the transmitter to the receiver um, within about 10, five to 10 microseconds. Um, even yeah. if you have, even if you have, you know, 90, 90, 95% signal loss, you still maintain that lock and you can even maintain it without, uh, yeah, without any packets for, for a few seconds as well. Like it's, it actually works really well. Right, so you um, basically have two two timers running, one on the receiver, one on the transmitter, yeah. and they stay in step, and then they synchronize themselves periodically, and then yeah. occasion, you know, if you don't have any packets for a long time, I guess they start to drift out of out of alignment just because the because the differences in the chips. Yeah, yeah. So, so yes, yeah, so that, this is actually one of the challenges that we have more than most is because uh, manufacturers are making very cheap hardware. And so the, the crystal yeah. offsets aren't great <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on, uh, on this bit of code that I'm talking about, we, it's actually amazing. We can tolerate like 10 to 20% offset. It's actually, it's not a problem at all. It's more of a problem on the RF side of thing because there's mm. another crystal that has to be matched there. Um, but anyway, in, in terms of this, yeah, in terms of this phase lock loop, it, it works really well. And it has like kind of like two phases. So it has like this long-term kind of uh, on like on a period of seconds, it then has it, it matches the it, it adds a um it adds a static frequency offset positive or negative to the receive side that then makes the two crystals come into phase, and then yep. it also does this thing where it has like an instantaneous correction where if it receives a packet that's unexpectedly late or unexpectedly early, the next one is instantaneously phase shifted with respect to that one to to then lock that together. So these mm -hmm. two things work together and quickly. The system yeah converges on a locked status uh, and so we're, yeah. yeah we have a bit of code that decides when it's locked and yeah there's some logic there's some logic based around that um and so yeah this is important because you know i said before that our headroom is really really short our yeah. headrooms let's say 200 microseconds so if your receiver is off by one micro if, if your crystals are off by one microsecond um and you receive 200 packets you know if it's off by one microsecond every interval sorry and then you yeah. receive 200 packets that's that's only one second so you, you can have unacceptable drift within a second that that would then uh, cause the link to to become un, unstable. Hmm. Um, and there's various other mechanisms that then yeah that then try to get get it back into step and yeah, um, yeah. it all works it all works quite well. So <laughs> rest assured, um, we we spent ye like honestly years of effort have gone into making sure that that is reliable. And um, that's all driven. Is that all driven fundamentally from this desire to have this really high duty cycle? which means that suddenly you have to solve all of these other kind of cascading yeah. problems and everything else in the code has to work really, really efficiently in a short space yeah. of time, yeah. which maybe yeah, yeah, if you exactly if right. you hadn't had that high duty cycle, you wouldn't have had to um, go to such lengths, you know? Yeah, no, that, that's completely right. Um, but the upside is that doing all that, doing all those hard yards mean that you have you, overall, I think uh, you increase the system reliability um, because you yeah. really make sure that everything is working yeah, uh, yeah as it should be um and so well, sorry um i kind of forgot to mention this but one other, one other thing um and this goes this is because of our desire to minimize the size of the packets and all that one other thing we don't do that other systems do um is that other systems will uh transmit where they are in the hopping sequence within every packet so you, right. know, you, you have this hopping sequence that you go you know channel you, know, you yep. blast through the channels um, every pack, every packet contains that information, and that's I thought that's a waste of packets. <laughs> that that that's yeah. a waste of data, right? That is one byte, or however long your hopping sequence is. That's one byte of wasted information. So I didn't want to have that. Um, and so we have what I think perhaps a little bit unique is that we have um, these sync packets. 
So the sync packets are the ones that inform the receiver where in the hopping sequence the transmitter is and the receiver then uses that to lock onto the signal. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, I should also say that um, everything is another kind of design condition that I feel strongly is that it should, the link should be stable um, unidirectionally. I, I don't think, like, I, I want to avoid any sort of logic or any requirement that means that re the receiver has to transmit back. Um, I want everything to happen passively. And that's how it works. So the receiver does all this on the receive side completely passively. It doesn't, yeah, yeah there's, there needs, nothing happens on the TX to make this happen. It's all just receiver side logic, um, which I think is really important. It makes sense. You know, I mean, you, you tr trying to transmit back, you're you're going to be a lot more constrained in terms of power and maybe the antenna that you're able to use on the receive side. Whereas on the transmit side, you can you can have a one watt transmitter, you can have a huge antenna, you can have lots of extra things on your radio that doesn't really matter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Um, anyway, yes, yeah, so, and so the, this this feature that we have, which is not including the hop table in every packet, means that we really had to make sure that the bit of code that locks the receiver to the transmitter works exceptionally well because yeah. if you have a mismatch or if you have a slip um you never really well you, you do recover when you get another sync packet but the recovery mm. might take you know one second three seconds five seconds and it, it, it takes a, a, a lot longer so that's that's perhaps a bit of a trade-off that the, the yeah that we decided to do sure and are those sync packets are they sent sort of every every so many they like sort of periodic and is that similar to the telemetry rate as well? Because I know that the telemetry rate is also sent once every, you know, have many packets, depending on how you set it. Yeah, so there used to be quite simple, but it's a bit more complicated nowadays. Um, but the, the crux of it is that the sync packets sent every one and a bit seconds or so um, when the craft is, is um, unarmed. And so this is why we really push people to use arming on OX5, because we have a lot of, well, yeah. I think we have a lot of clever logic tied into that, right? So, for example, we won't, um, if, if once your craft is armed, you, you assume the link is up because you managed to arm it. And so then we then actually dial back the rate of sync packets. Sync packets might only come every three seconds or five seconds or something. Um, so, yeah, it, it can be a while before you get a sync packet. And if you're in an area of interference, then it can be even longer if you just probabilistically happen to miss some of them. Yeah. Um, but we, uh, Captain Bry, I think, deserves all the props for optimizing this because he, he spent a lot of time, um, yeah, making making it work better and making it um, kind of transparent to the user that this is happening in the background. Mm. Um, and then the telemetry ratio, yeah. So the tele telemetry ratio is is yeah, as it says, you know, if you have one to one twenty eight, every one twenty eight packets, it then instead of doing a transmit, the receiver sends a packet backwards uh, back to the transmitter. Sure. Um, there is some more cleverness as well uh, in the system now, where if you are disarmed, then it, it does it dynamically it can dynamically boost the telemetry ratio. So, for example, okay. if you are in the Lua script, you need to talk to the flight controller. Um, it'll 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 dynamically boost to one to two, and then it'll quickly okay. transfer all the telemetry you need to transfer to load the beta flight scripts to VTX, whatever you, whatever you're doing. And then quickly transfers it over, and then goes back to what you had originally set. So that 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 acts dynamically now. Um, and that and that obviously that doesn't happen if you're armed because when you're armed you're flying you might be racing you don't want to waste packets on telemetry yeah um, sure and you're probably not going to be using the lua script while you're armed anyway at least no you, you're not be advisable yeah, yeah. um cool. but actually here's, here's one little psa if you uh have the lua script running while you're flying you actually have a doubled packet every one second or so because the way open the way edge tx and open tx works is that if the lua requests to send a packet to the module then it doesn't send an rc packet that frame so right okay so that's an edge tx thing so just basically close that lua script window when you're when you're flying yeah honestly it doesn't matter uh, like you know you're not going to notice that um in my opinion anyway but yeah just no. a little little tidbit i mean presumably it's like yeah, if you're running at 250 hertz, it's a, a four millisecond, you know, blip every second. So yeah, it's pretty pretty rare. Yeah. So if you see, it, if if you log, you you can see it. Like you will see a small spike in your feed forward. Um, mm -hmm. It's 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 a particularly bad case um, because uh, Chris, um, I, I worked a lot with Chris CTC Snooze from the Better Flight team yeah. um, to really optimize the the feed. He's he, he's done amazing work to optimize how feed forward forward works. Um, more or less like because i was like you know 
sending sending packets to Betaflight at 200 hertz, and Betaflight was not quite sure what what to do with it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm actually I actually had a I had a wonderful interview with him on on all of the changes for feed forward in Betaflight 4.3. So I'll put a link to that if people are interested. Yeah. Um. And so before we move on to the other topic, I guess this is perhaps a good spot to talk about um SPI because I just mentioned how. Uh, our code has a really short kind of this really short critical window, mm -hmm. um, and so that was a huge problem when we well when uh, so the SPI code kind of a lot of people worked on it, but probably the main uh, the main person was Phobos. Um, so Phobos was one of the main contributors to the SPI code. Obviously, I, I did quite a bit. Steve Evans did quite a bit. A lot of other people contributed. Um, so yeah, props to everyone who got that working. And yeah, yeah sadly, we have decided perhaps to not officially support SPI in, in 3.0, um, mm -hmm. but we are working on, well, I know that it is being, uh, some subset of 3.0 will run on SPI receivers in the future. So yeah, it's not gonna be a complete non-support, but you're not gonna have all, yeah. of the, all of the modes currently supported. Anyway, sorry, <laughs> back on track a little bit. So yeah, so this critical time window was a nightmare <laughs> dealing with uh, dealing with Betaflight because Betaflight of course has to do a lot of other things rather than just maintain the RC link. Mm, um, yeah. So it, this was back when we had the uh, original scheduler, uh, the original schedule developed by um, Mike, I think it was, um, which was, you know, it, it worked functionally, it worked fine, but it tended to let tasks run late. Um, and Steve, mm -hmm. Evans, Steve Evans was one of the main, um, yeah, was the main person because he, he rewrote it to be much more deterministic and much more reliable. Um, yes. so thanks to him. But still, even after he had, had done that, um, yeah we there was literally like this period of time where we would just have random instabilities we just have the, the link would just drop like the chip would would gum up or the frequency wouldn't hop in time or something would go wrong um because betaflight was you know too busy doing something else to get around to the rc link side of things um sure. and that, that that took a lot of time um a lot of time to debug um we're talking you know i was running you know i'd have an fc on the desk running at 80 percent cpu load overnight trying you know, tweaking things, trying, yeah. Yeah. Get the to try, try, yeah, trying to capture the one little edge case that caused a lockup because, you know, it's going to happen to someone. You, you don't want that to happen. Um, but mm -hmm. I'm happy to say that uh, as a 4.3, I believe it's completely stable. Um, I tested, I've tested F1, uh, F411, I tested um, DOM's H7 FC, um, you know, to, in worst possible conditions. So I'm talking like high CPU load, um, the link quality down in the 20s to 50s. Mm -hmm. um and that's, that's been stable like for 12 plus hours at a time so i'm pretty confident it's it's not resolved but yeah th that that took a lot of time and a lot of restructuring um to the point where steve evans actually com completely rewrote one of the low level drivers that um phobos originally had written in in to, to make everything interrupt based so that the beta flight code would absolutely guaranteed get around to hopping frequency to putting the receiver back into rx mode and doing all the critical things um in in the right time and, and that's so, specific for the spy implementation yeah. of of the of the chip. So, could yeah. you tell me a little bit what's the difference between uh, Express LRS over spy and Express LRS over UART? I mean, yeah. I mean, so it's exactly as it sounds. Uh, I guess the, the the biggest difference is that the the brains, the, the thing that actually maintains, because the radio is just a radio chip, right? It's, it's not, yeah. not got any intelligence of its own. Um, so in the spy receiver, all the receiver intelligence is in beta flight. So right. it's, all, it's it's all within the beta flight code. Um, and given, yeah, so th this is the main issue with SBI, given how slow uh, beta flight releases have been in the past um, compared to how quickly we've been moving, um, it's just, it's hard to keep them lockstep. Um, yeah. And yeah. also of, of the dev team, they're really, the, pe people are more interested in working on, on you know, in, in the original project versus replicating the same thing in in Betaflight. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, look, I happen to like 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 Whoops. Um, and in fact, my both my five inch quads are running SBI receivers right now. They're running the Happy Model mm -hmm. Pancake, uh, which which I think is a really nice little FC. So I have a bit of a sore spot for for SBI, much to to, to the dismay of some others. Um, so yeah. Um, uh, sorry, I also should say, so the reason this isn't an issue with, for example, D8 or D16 is because the duty cycle of those links is only around about 40 or 50 percent. And right. so there is quite a generous window where you can hop frequency. 
Um, yeah. And also because the packets contain the hop index, the, 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 they tell you where you are in the hop table, you can always recover great. You can always easily recover. So it doesn't really yeah. matter if you lose yeah. a bunch of packets. The next packet, you're, you're in a known state again. Um, mm. Whereas first LRS, that kind of state, uh, yeah, th th that state is not explicitly uh, told to the receiver every packet. So it needs to be more stability in, in, in the receiving side of things. I hope that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. So for for Spy, you've got the the flight controller, that chip doing all of the, the running all the code for the radio. And then in the UART, have you got a separate, is there a separate um, like SCM32 or something on that board that's that's doing it? Or is it built into the chipset? Yeah, so the, of course, there has to be a separate CPU. And so I think, yeah, this is one of the um, things that we do differently, again, I think, mm. is that we support a lot of different um, configurations. So all right. um, the most popular is, well, yeah, the most popular is the ESP8285, mm -hmm. which is the expressive chipset. So and that's the only chipset that does Wi-Fi. So if you have, if you have, if you've used Wi-Fi, you have that chipset. Right. Um, but then also in the earlier days, we added support for STM32, uh, so STM32 F103, STM32 F303, which is what Ghost uses, mm -hmm. um, and then there is STM32 F, uh, sorry L4, uh, which is an older design. Yeah. So we support a lot of a lot of different hardware platforms, and that's also been a challenge to make sure that they all work. Um, because when you make some major changes that you you're concerned might uh, have some follow-on effects, you have to test all the all those combinations. And especially early on, we had really weird issues where, you know, you'd have, uh, you know, you'd have a STM32 receiver would would have some weird behavior when talking to a ESP32 based transmitter, or vice versa, yeah. you have some bit of weirdness. And you know, eventually we discovered that it was some some minor thing in the Arduino framework where. You know, for example, in the hardware timer library, you would write a register and you would think it would update instantly, but on STM32, it updated next cycle, but on ESP32, it updated that cycle. So you'd have lots of little yeah. weird edge cases that had to be resolved. Um, so that was that was, that was was a lot of work as well, honestly. Um, but we structured the, well, I shouldn't take all the credit, like, yeah, the, all the other developers have been instrumental in this, but we structured the code in such a way that it's very, modular and very yeah. generic so um you can almost plug and play little bits of things here and there so you um, sort of separated out the hardware agnostic code from like basically the the yeah. drive the, like the drivers for each each chip that you're using yeah exactly um and there, there's lots of layers of, of abstraction and yeah it all mm. it all works um there used to be a monumental amount of if defs and if stm32 else if <laughs> this else if that uh, a lot of that is it's cleaned up now, but yeah, yeah. because you know, back when we started, we had no idea that we'd be supporting eight different CPUs and three different, um, you know, sorry, yeah, all these different frequencies and all these different things. So the code kind of, you know, you, yeah. you, you get a lot of technical debt <laughs> when you try to hack things together. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with, with how well it all works, to be honest. Uh, I think I think the developers have done a fantastic job. Um, and that's probably, this. yeah, I'm kind of, Perhaps jealous of TBS and, and Ghost, and that they really only have one one architecture to support. <laughs> yeah, uh, they, they have kind of complete really, control, and they don't. Ha yeah. They just have to have one, yeah, one companion chip, one radio yeah. chip, and make that work. Yeah, and one of the things that I think is worth mentioning is that going forward, are we going to? Are we? Do you think we're going to start seeing all-in-one flight controllers that instead of having you know spy-based receivers, they just have a companion? They just have basically a UART. A UART based yeah. ELRS receiver. Yeah, so I, I don't want to, I don't want to leak any leak any potential products. But yeah, so th there will be a alternative to SPI receivers. That's going to be a very nice, clean solution. It's going to fix not only the receiver side of things, but we're going to fix a few other annoying problems uh, with with Betaflight <laughs> in terms of smart audio and VTX and that kind of thing. So there's going to be oh cool yeah the, the thing, things are coming. That's going to yeah. I'm yeah. Really so it's so and and it sounds like it's gonna there's going to be effectively a um a separate chip on that board, and it will it will behave kind of like how it behaves now. If you have a an ELRS receiver soldered up, that you can flash ELRS firmware individually to a to a chip, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And there are actually some uh, whip, whip boards that already do that. Um, mm. So yeah. the Happy Model used to make one, and I actually actually used to make a 900 megahertz. Uh, ELRS whip board um, that was separate though it was a it's just a UART thing a UART receiver on, on the board 
Yeah. Um, there is a JH, JHE MCU one, which I actually don't recommend because I've heard some people saying that it fails, um, that that already does that. But yeah, so that is the direction we're going to push manufacturers in the future, um, just because that way we kind of have the most amount of control yeah. um, over and just yeah, le less user issues as well <laughs> in terms yeah, of updating. Yeah. yeah. It makes it makes sense because you're two separate projects, you and Beta Flight, and it makes sense that you you can each flash your code to an individual, you know, MCU on there. So um, yeah, coming on to the packet rate, the packet size and structure that you guys have. I mean, we talked a bit about it already, but what would you say are the key trade-offs that people need to be aware of when they're thinking about, you know, range, penetration, latency? Um, and some advice maybe you can give people who want who want to use ELRS, what settings they should use for particular situations. Sure. Um, so it, it kind of, it, it depends. Um, I'll just, yeah, I'll, I'll just start talking, let's say. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think for most people, LoRa, LoRa at 200 hertz is, is, is good enough. Um, I think, I think that's sufficient for like, yeah, for, for, unless you're an extreme racer or mm -hmm. you want to have, I don't know, you want to push the limits of range or you want to, yeah, to do a lot of those other things. Um, the the new um, D modes that are in 3.0 um, that Jai and, and Cap um, contributed heavily to. So uh, I didn't actually work on the the new FLRC and the new D modes. That was entirely um, Jai and Cap and Bryce and the other developers. So um, kudos to them. But I would push races towards them, um, particularly D500 and D250. Um, so they are uh, yeah time division diversity essentially. I believe it's the same thing that Ghost is doing with their race modes, like their race 250, race 500, where you just you transmit multiple packets, so you, you have an opportunity to capture. Essentially, you just have yeah, it's it's time based redundancy instead of forward error correction. You take a little bit of a hit on latency doing that, but that is then made up for more than enough by the fact that those modes use FLRC, so that yeah, so overall overall latency actually is is less. Um, and on the on the F1000, the latency actually is almost. I can't quite claim that it is, but it's almost below one millisecond. Like wow. it's, it's it's getting very close to below one millisecond if you crank the board rate, crank everything. So not quite there yet, but yeah, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty excited <laughs> that we managed to do that. Um, yeah, I am, um, I am as well. I just kind of jump in here because a yeah. lot of people like because I I talk about um, a lot about kind of vibration and tuning and and loop late on PID loop latency and filtering and everyone goes oh just you know whether it's 20 milliseconds or or like 30 milliseconds how much difference does it really make and so yeah i'm i'm kind of on board that just every millisecond that you can save anywhere you know a millisecond on your video a millisecond on your radio link that is just going to give you the information to react to a sudden situation unexpected event it just arrives one millisecond faster. So whatever your reaction time is, whether you're, you know, Captain Vanover and you've got like a, a super fast sub 100 millisecond reaction time or you're me and it takes you like a second to do anything, um, you still are going to be able to react that little bit quicker if you get the information sooner. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but then look, you also have to do the other, the other, the, you have to play devil's advocate and say, look, in a double blind, would you be able to tell? And then, then it starts to get a little bit a little bit questionable <laughs> because I, I I've, I've tried myself and I thought it would be trivial but it's harder than you think to tell the difference between let's say 150 and 500. <laughs> um, yeah, I yeah, I agree. I don't think I would be able to tell. In fact, I would challenge anyone to be able to tell because I don't think you know I could feel it at all. But I know that getting the information a millisecond sooner means that everything else equal, my reaction is going to be a millisecond sooner and if that if the link transmits that to the quad faster yeah. then the quad will react more quickly so yeah. even even though i probably would never be aware of it it might save me in a situation there'll be one situation where i avoid a crash with the faster link that i wouldn't have been able to avoid with the slower link yeah yeah um and so so i, I didn't actually answer your question about about trade-offs um the captain bry on his channel has a has a very very good video about all the packet modes in express rs 3.0 um, so you could, you could put that as a link or as a card. He does a very good job at explaining the trade-offs. So I won't bother trying to um, okay. replicate what he said. He, yeah, he's, yeah. Um, go watch that video. Um, but I do, I do want to say, if there's one thing you learn, uh, if you're at a race and you're having problems with interference or you're having problems with LQ dipping because there's 80 transmitters on, 
try one of the D modes, try D250 or D500, um, because they have shorter, the packets are shorter, the duty cycle is actually not when nowhere near 100 percent and so you you might have um yeah it's kinder to everyone else and you'll have a better time as well um just you know in case you're at multi gpio or something and, you know yeah. i i think personally i think that they should instigate a rule that if you're in the pits your transmitter is off uh because you just see transmitters on in the pits just you know polluting the air for no reason yeah so if there's no reason to do that let's let's just treat it like a, a vtx and just turn it off when you're not using it so <laughs> um and yeah yeah, I think it does make sense because you you wouldn't think like I, you leave the transmitter on and your quad's not armed and you don't think it's causing a problem, but yeah, it, it is. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it can do if that, depending on how many there are. Yeah, yeah. So I, I actually wanted to implement like a low power mode um, a while ago, and so uh, Axis actually has something very similar. They have like a low power. They have an accelerometer in their Express LRS module. So if you're inactive for a while, then it, you can, yeah, you, you can dynamically reduce the power. But I, well, I wanted to have something, you know, completely shut it off or something. You know, I, we eventually decided not to do that because we couldn't be confident that there wouldn't be weird edge cases that would cause issues or inconsistencies or the link not to behave as expected. But yeah, it's something that I think, um, yeah, it could be something for, for the future perhaps, or at the very least, I think people should be aware of the fact that they are polluting whenever their transmitter is on. <laughs> yeah yeah and it's a good point and that often like it wouldn't like if the quads not not on you can turn your radio off so it yeah. kind of makes sense so i think that comes on to the final topic that i wanted to talk to you about uh, sandra which is the future of of elrs and what you guys are working on what's going to be coming up um and what you're particularly excited to to talk about me yeah sure so Look, I think now that we just recently dropped 3.0, I think most of the like criticisms have been like quelled. I, I, at least I hope so. The feedback um, has been incorporated, is what you're saying. Yeah, I, I can yeah. hear it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, like, you know, um, there are going to be 16 channel uh, PWM receivers coming. There's, there's going to be like, yeah, um, we're going to, not yet, but we're working towards unified targets. So, we're working okay. towards not having to compile unique firmware for each target. Um, it'll be like Betaflight where you have a uh, like an architecture firmware file and then you have a hardware definition file. And so the, mm -hmm. that'll that'll yeah, that'll help resolve some issues. Um, so for me, I think, of course, other maybe other developers have other thoughts, but I think the the fundamental the link side of things is is looking pretty good. Um, we probably once we get more information, more feedback, and more more science essentially about the FLRC modes, we might make some tweaks to that. Um, we might find that other parameters work better. As I said, one of the issues is that we have this, um, we have frequency offset tolerance um, that we need to meet for for links to work reliably. And so you can you can be in the case where you buy a TX from someone, an RX from someone, and just statistically, the frequency error is too large for a reliable connection. Um, mm -hmm. And we've named name manufacturers that have been doing that. Uh, so right. no need to repeat that. Uh, most of the time it's fine um we thought we had a solution to it actually and ghost does this actually ghost um if, if you use a specific mode of uh if you use there's two modes of laura packer there's like an implicit header mode and an explicit header mode the implicit header, header mode is slightly shorter packet like a smaller packet so, so we use that one um, but if you have the explicit header mode enabled the radio can tell you approximately the frequency error that it has um and then you can you can compensate for that as well um, and so Ghost, Ghost has that, um, which is great. Yeah, great for them because that essentially means that, that that is no longer a problem for them. Um, but for us, we couldn't do that and also maintain the existing packet rates. The packet would just get too big. Yeah, it'd take too long to transmit and you'd have to yeah. drop the frequency. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, we spent a lot of time kind of thinking about ways to have like a calibrate because you, you can calibrate it out. Um, but we couldn't really think of an easy user friendly way to have that work transparently and reliably. So instead, we just uh, put some pressure on manufacturers not to put out shit hardware, <laughs> um, which which has been, as you know, has been an issue in the past. <laughs> I mean, it's always an issue in our hobby um, because we're so cost sensitive as a as a community. You know, manufacturers know they need to make things at a low cost. So. Yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, I think I think the link side of things, I, I think I think we're doing a great job. Um, I have some ideas of like niche cases. Um, for example, Wes was working on a way to. Um, a lot of people want like they want Mavlink, let's say. Um, so I don't think Mavlink isn't on the table. 
at the moment, likely probably never will be. There is a fork actually. If you want Mavlink on ELRS, someone's got a working fork with Mavlink. Um, so go have a look. I think I think it's working. I'm not sure. I remember someone working on it. Anyway, so the link side of things I think is 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 pretty consolidated. Um, um, pretty happy. Maybe we need some tweaks. Maybe we need some additional modes. I personally wouldn't mind after getting some feedback and some statistics about 3.0, maybe culling some of the less used modes. Although users always hate when you remove features, uh, even if even if it makes yeah, it even simple. if it makes things easier. Yeah, yeah, because we have 11 modes now, so like it's it's way way too many. Well, yeah. okay, it's not way too many, but you know, if you're a newbie, explaining to you the kind of drawbacks and the benefits of all these modes is a little bit. Yeah, it can be a little bit difficult, which is why I say, look, everyone just use Laura 250. <laughs> yeah, yeah. it'll work great. <laughs> yeah, it'll, it'll work fantastic. You'll never have a range issue. Um, so I think where, where we're moving towards, where I would like to see some improvement is more like um, ease of use, so having more of a polished experience. Um, mm. So with you know, with the unified targets, with the configurator, um, hopefully with hopefully with web-based flashing, I think that, that should be feasible. Um, and then also more connectivity. So like, mm -hmm. you know, we have the, we have Wi-Fi on board. So um, we are currently working on, you know, we have the uh, VTX backpack, where the v, whether you have the, another chip that talks to your goggles. Um, yeah. So we we we're in discussion with all of the major manufacturers of, of video systems um, to to make sure that works with their system. And I would like to see, for example, I would like to see a feature where I can just tick a thing and say, hey, I'm at a race. Go talk to the race PC that's coordinating races and just sort out my channel for me. I don't want to think Sign about me a what, channel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't want to think about having the right channel. I'm just, you know, I'm just. This is my this is my call sign. You tell me what channel I got to be on, and then every time you plug in the quad, boom, it's on that channel. Um, mm. That's what I want to see. I also want to see some things around having OSD elements, like custom OSD elements. Um, for example, what something I thought would be really cool would be to you, you go to a race. Um, you know, and instead of scrolling through channels, you have essentially a mesh network of receivers and ESP devices, and it just tells you the pilot names. You know, I want to watch my buddy Jai. I want to watch my buddy Wes. Oh, instead, of being so like, oh, cool. instead of being, hey, Jai, what channel do you want? Or R1, F1, scroll through, kind of, you know. I, I think you that choose that the would name be. of the person you want to spectate, and it's like, dunk. Yeah, now I'm yeah, spectating yeah. that person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that would be amazing. Um, I think uh, this actually, th this already works. Um, if you have a specific set of hardware, one, one of the developers um, did a proof of concept um, with the core, with the Chorus 32, actually, um, my race timer project, where whenever you completed the lap, it would flash your lap time up on your OSD. Oh, very neat. Yeah. yeah. That's just, yeah. That, that's fantastic for training. I mean, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because you, you never hear the call out when there's like 20 people to, to doing laps and stuff. Um, so, yeah, we started talking to the... Um, Rotor hazard guys. We started talking to um, uh, who who does the oh, I forget right now. Anyway, we, we, we're talking to everyone we can. He wants he wants to hear us about all these crazy ideas to kind of, kind of work towards. And I have to give credit to Giant Wes. They're kind of like the business development duo, and that they're the ones who really push the um, the communication and the. You should see our Discord. But we have chats with every manufacturer just to try to make sure everyone's up to date, everyone's on board, everyone's mm -hmm. got accurate information. So. Um, yeah, they're doing great work. So just a quick shout out to them. <laughs> well, well, I'm just... All right. Well, I guess the final thing then before I let you go, Alessandro, is um, how can people support you? Um, so we have an open collective. Um, so you can you can go there. You can donate to us one off. You can do a uh, monthly donation. Um, so that would be appreciated. We we use that money to buy equipment. Um, buy RF analyzers, buy gear for our developers, um, that kind of stuff, um, and support Deadbyte. Uh, Deadbyte's probably, I'm not sure if, you, if you've seen Deadbyte on the Discord, Deadbyte, Deadbyte's got his own, um, like, buy me a coffee link. Uh, so he probably, I, I want to shout him out as deserving, you know, de he deserves more than just the pool support. He just probably deserves a bit more. He's got, he, every day he's helping people, answering questions, all that kind of stuff. So supporting him also supports the project. Um, and yeah, look, we're kind of lucky in that we um, we have manufacturers on board supporting us. So like all these radios over here, I haven't. I yeah, I know. Of... I was about to say you've got quite a collection over there. It looks really good. Yeah, <laughs> I think I counted before I came along. I've got thirteen radios. <laughs> so I bought some of them. Some of them were yeah test units given to us. Um, I, I want to shout out Ra Radio Master has been very the best, like hands hands down the best in terms of 
giving us gear, giving us mm -hmm. feedback, just communication, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that plaque on the wall is actually from them as a, as a thank you. So you probably can't read that, but that's a, oh. they said, <laughs> yeah, that's they sent really a thank you. So that was, that's really nice. Um, so we're, we're kind of in the fortunate position where the manufacturers are supporting us too, we, we, mm. not monetarily, um, but in terms of like hardware and gear, which, which is, you know, honestly the, the main expense. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's really great. Well, I'll put links and cards and stuff um, to all of those places where people can support you um and i hope that people do because i think this is it's, it's really great to see an open source you know completely open source like hobby started off as a hobby project like yeah. it's now developed into i think probably one of the most exciting options for for radio links that that exists in the hobby right now um mainly because you know just availability of, of hardware is so good now because so many people are making it um yeah, so it's it's really fantastic to see. Yeah, yeah thank Great. you, Chris. Hope, hope I didn't ramble off on tangents for too long. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, no problem at all. Um, is there anything else that you wanna that you wanted to talk about before I let you go? What haven't we covered? Uh, oh, I forgot. I forgot to. Uh, Jai, Jai will kill me. So Jai has been hev uh, <laughs> heavily working on having um, full, like proper receiver diversity. So the current round of oh, diversity okay. receivers are just antenna diversity. So there is a bit of logic. Uh, that just tries to guess which antenna is better. And yeah, it's look, it, it's antenna diversity. So it's been around for a while. Mm. Um, so we will soon have full receiver diversity. So two separate um, RF, uh, two separate chipsets on board that will be able to independently receive signals. Um, okay, cool. And we're thinking about cool ideas like doing like like proper like full, like, you know, having the two radios on different hopping frequencies or different, you know, downlink, uplink. So there's lots of cool possibility um, of, of future work yeah that, that we can do in that space as well i think that would be really exciting i mean i know i know when particularly when looking at bigger quads like long range quads and cine lifters um yep. you can get quite bad shadowing effects if the if the if you've only got one antenna but if you have two i mean antenna diversity i guess would help with that but full receiver diversity you could have two separate yeah separate yeah it, it um, just listen if it gets a packet you, you're good um look i i've been yeah i guess i want to i want to i think i think one market we haven't really penetrated that much is the city lifter market i think everyone on city lifters is using um still using crossfire which yeah look that makes yeah. sense you want a reliable system that you used before um but i have to say that um i'm happy to see uh fernand fernand wolf i think his name is mm -hmm. and, and, and YouTube. he was the guy yeah. who did who did, the, who did the tesla video um and so he's he's using Express RS exclusively with the with the Radio Master Zorro on his like big expensive job. So I was really, yeah really happy to see some of the signal lifter guys start to consider it as a as an option as well. It's really yeah. cool. To see. That's great. Um, and and any any functionality that you add to sort of around that diversity stuff is gonna is gonna only make it more attractive for those people because I think there is a there are crossfire options that have antenna diversity but i don't know if there's any full receiver diversity systems with crossfire oh, i think they have a big module i've they have a big receiver that's full diversity i believe yeah so, uh, yeah you're right it's a big it's a, but it's big it's big but you're in a city lifter so yeah you know <laughs> it doesn't um, matter doesn't matter uh we could yeah we maybe this may be a bit of a more controversial topic we could talk about like that like fcc like regulations and stuff um because that that's been a bit of a um a fair criticism is fine. Uh, it's to be expected. Um, and so I'm happy to say that in the background, there are some manufacturers working on having cert like FCC certified hardware. Um, oh, I think be great. some guys in, in Japan as well, I think are looking into it. Um, and so, it, yeah, it's coming. And of course we have, we have LBT now in 3.0. So um, we have LBT for the CE users. Um, yeah. We also have, uh, if you don't want to use LBT, which I think, LBT is is a pain, <laughs> to to be honest, um, because you don't want to you know if you're in a congested environment, uh, yeah, in in your you, if you're obeying LBT and other people aren't obeying LBT, LBT you are in a world of hurt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in terms of getting your, your packets out. Um, so there's also there's also like a 10, 10 milliwatt mode which you're allowed to use in LBT areas without using LBT. So that's okay. another another option. And ten milliwatts is enough for yeah. For, for park flying, for racing, that, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, absolutely, especially if you're using the the T antenna on the on the quad rather than the EP two. Okay. Yeah, yeah, fine. 
Cool. Well, I guess the final thing to do is just to is for me to thank you very much, Alessandro, for taking the time to talk to me today. We covered a lot of different stuff, um, and I hope that people find the video really interesting, and I hope that people um, feel like they're able to support you and the work that you're doing. Uh, all the links for that are, are down below, as I said. Um, and yeah. uh, I'll let you get on with your day because uh, you've got much more important things to do than uh, sit chatting to me. So. Oh, not really. It's, 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 been, it's been fun. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. You have a good evening. Uh, Thanks very much. I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope you have a really good day. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. What a lovely guy. Am I right? I really appreciate you taking the time to watch all the way to the end of the video. Please take that extra second to hit the like button, check that you're subscribed to the channel and leave a comment down below. Did you enjoy the interview? What did you think of it? And who would you like me to interview next? That's all I have for you for today. So until next time, I wish you all very, very happy flying.